many years ago when I saw a, a, a great wedding, I was freaking out because, I mean, I'm country, you know what I'm saying? That's the first time I'd ever been on, on, on board a ship. I went on the next cruise, and I went to Athens, and we're out there. And just so happens that there's a great wedding going on. And I hear this kind of polka like music, you know what I'm saying? And I looked down there, and when I did, there's something. I mean, these guys are doing that, you know, that, that leg thing. Every time I hear that music, I'm waiting for somebody to go out on it, you know what I'm saying? You know? <laughs> and I'm thinking, if you want the preacher to help, you better give me a sentence when so I can do it, you know what I'm saying? We have been making a journey for the cross, right? I mean, you look, for the last five weeks, we've been in Lent. Since Ash Wednesday, we've been in a season of Lent. And Lent, the whole intended purpose for the last almost 2,000 years is that the church takes a breath and reminds itself and reminds and share with others a holy and blessed and sacred truth a truth above all truth. When we lose this truth, we lose the reason that we exist. Hear me well. You cannot miss this point. You and I cannot ever give up this ground because this is not some social club of religious activity. This is a gathering of brothers and sisters, children of Almighty God who have been washed in the blood of Almighty God through His Son, Jesus Christ, on Calvary. That Jesus suffered, bled, and died for you and me and others. Amen. Amen. And when we forget that, or when we dilute that, or when we dismiss that, then what is the reason that we exist and why do we gather? If the only reason we gather is to sing a few songs, give a little bit of money, and say a few prayers, stay home. But it's when brothers and sisters who are broken and wounded realize that there is no other place that we can go no other person to whom we can come than Jesus. And we come to Him in our woundedness. We come to Him in our brokenness. And we have great expectations. The expectations that we have is that when we call upon His name, He will hear us. And we come to Him and we offer to Him our brokenness and woundedness. He will heal us from the inside out. Yes. It may very well be that when I ask for healing, I will walk with a limp. Others have. But if I receive the grace of God that I've been blessed, and so have you. Amen? amen? Yes, amen. And so we stand here this good day on the precipice of eternity, looking back in our history, looking forward to our future, and we proclaim a positive, life-changing message. Don't ever forget it. And as we have been walking with Him, some things we should test. The days are over when the church and the reason that we are in the problems that we are and suffer the maladies that we do is that we think that there's no big deal. There is a big deal. We serve a holy God, don't we? I don't know about y'all, but it says as I read my scriptures that God doesn't want second, best, or leftovers. He wants our best. He wants our dedication. He wants our obedience. He wants our faithfulness. He wants brothers and sisters and sons and daughters that are willing to suffer and sacrifice so that they can obtain the blessings of the Almighty. That's just how it is. Now, if you want second best, cool. Go for it. But I don't know about y'all. I want the best, don't y'all? I, I want to eat at the front of the hog, not the back of it. You know what I'm saying? And so God allows us that privilege. And so yes, we've been taking the journey. And next Sunday, we're going to wind up at the foot of Calvary and at an empty tomb, and we're going to see a resurrected Lord that's good news. But the journey thus far has taken us towards the city. Remember Bartimaeus? Outside Jericho. A nobody. An absolute nobody. Forgotten by the world. Forgotten by most people's assumptions and opinions. Forgotten by God too. Judged by God. Harshly judged by God. And as Bartimaeus stands, sits out there begging, asking for alms from those passing by, he hears a commotion. And in that commotion, somebody says, it's Jesus, and he's passing by. I said, remind you. You realize that if you die today, and Jesus passes by, and you don't know him, this is a one-time deal. He's passing by right now. Do you know it? Do you? Do you know that you know that you know that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Do you know that? Do you know right now if you die right here, 
right now, do you know, with absolute clarity and confidence and assurance, do you know that you would die and go to heaven? Do you know that? Because if you don't know that, you need to talk to me or somebody you trust. Because God help you if you go through life with a question mark. God help you. If all you can do is say, I'm good. No, you're not good. None of us are good until we, until we answer the question of eternity that's dogging every one of us. And you and I can say, I don't really care. One day you will. One day you will. And that one day too late thing is for real, brothers and sisters. And so here we join a mass of people gathered around a blind guy. They can see, but they don't. He can't see, but he does. You talk about irony? And so there he sits just like we do. We sit on the, on the side of life, and we hear a commotion. And we say, what's going on, y'all? What's going on? Where Jesus is passing by, and in that is a challenge. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with the opportunity that has been presented to you? And it is a one-time deal. When he passes by, this time he ain't coming through again because he's walking towards a cross. And he knows that. So as he walks by, we see his blindness. Then we hear his belief. Lord, have mercy on me. Then we see his boldness. What can I do for you? Lord, give me sight. Then we see his blessing. Once he received his sight, he shared that message with everybody he could. Let me tell you something. I, I, we're just talking real straight here. I don't have lock jaw with you. I don't have lock jaw. Well, somebody says, what is wrong with you? Jesus. I know I know Jesus, man. You know what I'm saying? I know him on a first name basis to him. I talk to him every day. And I'm not being, I'm not being, I'm not being a whatever about this thing. I mean, this thing's real, man. I know what I am. I know what I was. I know where I was going. I know where I am. And I got peace, man. I got peace way down in my soul. Yeah. I know if I die right now, I know where I'm going. I ain't no question mark. I don't want the next, I don't want the next bus, but I ain't scared no more. I'm not scared of death. I'm not scared of dying. I am sometimes scared of life and living, you know. But Bartimaeus, he represents all of us. He's passing by. Bartimaeus understood that. Bartimaeus reached out and said, I need me some of some, I need me some of what you got. And he received the grace of God, and he was made whole. Story for all of us. He was broken. God fixed him. Are you? He was blind. God gave him sight. How about you? He was needful. God fixed the need. He was helpless. God gave him help. God gave him a hand up, not a hand out. And so there he sits, and we sit with him. Didn't stop there. Then he went into the city, and there another guy. On the other side of the spectrum, Zacchaeus was a rich guy, a tax collector, a cheap tax collector. This guy had everything a guy could want, yet he was hated by everybody. And that blows my mind. Y'all hear me well. They some people in life I don't like. You hear me? I don't like. I don't like murderers. I don't like child abusers. I don't like wife or husband. I don't like that kind of stuff. It's wrong. And so, there this guy sits. And he may have the finest clothes on. He's got money in the bank. He's got the best donkey around. I mean, he got everything, you know. But the one thing he doesn't have is peace. And the one thing he doesn't have is Jesus. Peace with himself. Peace with others. And peace with God above. And so as Jesus passed by, the little fellow bless his heart. He can't get to Jesus any other way, so he runs down the road, climbs up in a tree. He hangs out over there, waiting to see, to get a look at Jesus. Don't miss the point. He knew what he knew who Jesus was. It's not about wanting to see him physically. It's about what's this? What's what's going on with this guy? What has this guy got that I need? And drawn by his curiosity, he is willing to risk <coughs> questioning. Those things that he had been told. Now let's make sure we understand. Somewhere in that crowd we find Bartimaeus, don't you think? And so people can argue all day long, I don't believe in this Jesus. That's cool by me. You can die in your ignorance and go to hell. That's cool by me if that's your choice. But there is nobody that can stand before the bar of God and say, well, they meet brothers and sisters and sons and daughters of Almighty God, 
When we live the life, and when we walk the walk, and when we talk the talk, there is nobody that will ever stand before the bar of God and say, nobody told me about Jesus. Because somewhere down your pathway, you're going to run into a true blue child of God that's going to live the life, walk the walk, talk the talk, do the deeds as they should. Amen. Amen. And when they do that, that's a powerful testimony, isn't it? Now, well, come on now. When you see somebody that brings Jesus, you know, now you can get mad about it, you can cuss, fuss, and kick off if you want to. And it does not change your <coughs> eternity. That brother or sister would die and go to heaven and be happy. And you might not. Now go ahead and fuss off if you want to, but that brother or sister has something you don't. That brother or sister has a grip on something you don't. And so maybe it ought to be that we would ask the question, as Zacchaeus did, what do you have that I don't that I need? You know what he had? He had a whole lot of love. Amen? Do you know what finally got me to, the, to my knees before Jesus? A simple, profound truth. That Jesus can love somebody like me because I couldn't even love myself. Y'all hear me? I could not even love myself. And yet to know, to be told that somebody loved me, a drug addict, if you were taken that way, an alcohol, lick, if you were taken that way, a sorry human being, defined by me and by others. I could give you their name and address. They tell you all about it. And yet to be told that, 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 that Jesus died, suffered, bled, and died for me. Do you hear me? For me. That blew my mind. That absolutely blew my mind. To think that Jesus Christ will suffer, bleed, and die for me. That does not have to be your testimony. It is mine. I don't care how you get to Calvary, and I don't care how you come to Jesus, get there. Yeah. If you've got a mom and daddy that brought you from the time of nursing you at their breast to the time that you could walk on, on, on good legs, if that's your testimony and you didn't have that experience, all you know is you've always known it, you ought to thank God every breathing day. Because not everybody has that testimony. And so you don't have to have some life-altering stroke of thunder that, that shatters the heavens to say, well now, it doesn't matter. Not everybody comes to Jesus the same way. The matter is, come to Jesus, y'all. Come to Jesus. Come on your face. Come on your knees. I don't care how you get there. Get to Jesus. And when you get to Jesus, realize you can't get any further on your own. You will not get to heaven based on anything other than what Jesus Christ did for you. And when you accept that truth, when you can, he can, he did, he will, amen, then it's going to be a better day. So now we get to credit. Here they come. They have walked through Jericho. They get to Bethany. It's Sunday. Sunday. Well, I should say Saturday. <clears throat> on Saturday, they walk into Simon the leper's house, one whom he had touched and cleansed, and he sits there with Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead, and he's given supper by the hands of Mary and Martha, and Mar Mary is the one that at that table broke open that burial ointment and put it all over Jesus so that when he left there the next morning, he still had the smell of death on him. Did you hear me? He's walking to his death, y'all. He's walking in a dusty dirt road. And he's making a journey to his death for you and me. In six days, he's going to suffer, bleed, and die. But on this night, that woman understands. She's been listening. She's been paying attention. And so she does because she don't need it anymore. Do you hear me? She doesn't need what she bought to bury her brother because there he sits as a waking, breathing testimony of Almighty God and the grace of God. Hallelujah. And so as Lazarus sits there and eats supper with Jesus and Simon the leper and others that have been touched and healed by Jesus, as she breaks open that ointment and pours it on him, the next morning when he leaves that house, Sunday morning, walking out of Bethany, everybody's gathered round about, and here we go, making a run for Jerusalem. Now some of that crowd said, for the king, it's the king, the king is coming, the king is coming. That's what Zachariah said, right? And so some said, no, he ain't. Some said, yeah, he is. Is that not the same challenge that confronts us today? 
We who sit here and those that sat there 2,000 years ago, some of us said, the king is coming. Others say, no, he ain't. The king is here. No, he ain't. The king will save us. No, he can't. Some of us had expectations, unrealistic expectations, about what we think God's going to do. May I say to you, God is not going to let everybody win the publisher's clear and have sweet stats. <laughs> Can you hear? You're not going to win. You're not everybody is not going to win. Weeders Digest, publisher's clear and we ain't all going to win the lottery. We ain't all going. To, we ain't all going to be blessed that way. Some might. And so if we pray that God gives us a million dollars to make us feel better, you may not get that prayer answered. But if we are praying that we can grow deeper and deeper in love with God, ourselves, and others, I bet he'll answer that one. I bet if we pray that I open the Word of God that I might understand the Word of God, I bet he'll answer that one. I bet if we pray that he hears our prayer, I bet he'll answer that one. And so those expectations that we have, are they right and righteous? Are they a little bit cynical, a little bit greed-based? Just a question. And so as they stand here this day, some are on the side of right and right, some are not. Some understand, some don't. Most, to be honest with you, they don't. They've been told the king is coming. There he is. I mean, come on, y'all. Look at what he did. I mean, and that's the quite, that, that's the conversation. I mean, he just he just healed part of mass, y'all. I mean, the guy's been blind all of his life, and now he's walking. He's, he's, he's healed. I mean, Lazarus, he, he raised the dead. And so as he walks out of Bethany, making his move for Jerusalem, and the crowd is gathered all around him, shouting and singing and doing all kinds of crazy stuff, he understands this is all about stuff and flow, emotions and all kinds of stuff. Because what they want is a warrior. They want a king that will crush their enemies. Jesus is not that king. He is not going to gather together a bunch of rebels Though he did. He's not going to come riding on a, on a stallion, but a donkey. He doesn't have bows and arrows and shields and spears and chariots and warriors. He's coming in the power of God to save souls and change lives and give a seed for the growth of his kingdom. Amen. They didn't want that. And so as they make their journey, he says, I need two of you guys to go get me a, a coat. Go over here and you'll find it. Because of that day, they did in obedience. Talking about gifts. We give Jesus. Gifts we give to the king. The gift of obedience. There's a common custom called Edgarian that had dealt that a dignitary could walk up and ask for anything and that person would give it because the person asked for it. Does that make sense? Let me play it out. If the governor walked up and said, I need to borrow your car because of the culture in which we live in, the law says you got to give him a police officer, you got to give him a car or whatever it is because who, who he is when he needs. And so Jesus walked up and said, I need me a donkey. You guys go get me one. So whatever way they played out, it doesn't matter. But when these two guys walked over there and they started untying this donkey, I don't know about y'all be freaking out, wouldn't you? What you do? It'd be the same thing if I looked at it in my front yard and I don't. But if I had a red convertible Porsche, I would remind you that the pastoral celebration might be coming today. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Now, you know, I don't want to boast about it. I'm going to be a Porsche. You know what I'm saying? But if I had a red convertible Porsche out there and I walked out my front door, there's two cats get inside that thing and they cranking it up, don't you think I'd ask the question? <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? What they did. They walk out, they see two guys untying the donkey and the baby and his mama, and they say, What you doing? And the answer is, Jesus needs it. That ended the discussion, didn't it? Now hear me. What can you give Jesus? Give him obedience. If, God, if Jesus tells you to do something, don't argue. Give it. Do it. Try, make the attempt at least. Amen? Amen? What does God need? What ability does God wish and desire from us? Dependability would be one of them. So what can we give the king? We can give him obedience. What can we give the king? We can give him gifts. What did they give him? They gave him the donkey. They gave him 
cloaks. That's their blanket. These guys, these men and these women, they wore a coat, a heavy external coat, because if they got caught out on a journey because of the laws, they would have to stop where they are and camp for the night. And so they needed a blanket, and so this became their blanket. And what they're doing is they're giving everything they got to Jesus. They're giving the most valuable possession that they have. We, I don't want to get in the ditch, but can, can we just talk for a second? I would love to have been at the end of the line, I'm telling you. You talk about entrepreneurship. Everybody in the front of the line, they throw their coats on. You know what I'm saying? Palm branches and throw their coats on this guy uh, for Jesus, to honor him. But the people in the back of the line, because they ain't getting it back. You hear what I'm saying? They know when they take this thing off, they ain't going to get it back because what they did not do, they didn't stop the parade. It's like, no, no, wait, don't look at those. You know? The donkey walked on it. All these other people walked on it. They, I mean, they trampled these things into the dirt. And so they, they, they destroyed this valuable commodity that people gave to Jesus. And at the end of the line, did they leave them in the dirt? Did somebody take them up? I don't know. But I do know this. What is Jesus asking from you? Come on. What's he asking from you? You know what we say? We have a choice. As we stand there and we see Jesus pass by, you have a choice. This don't cost you anything. This does. This meaningful though it may be, this palm branch, and they were abundant around that area. But this doesn't cost you anything. You can run over there and snatch one off a tree and throw it down and say, Hallelujah! And think you've done something. But God, though it's a blessing, does not need palm branches. God might ask you, me, us, and others. I need a coat. Beg pardon? I need this. Beg pardon? What is it that God is going to ask you that you just can't give? Because whatever that answer to that question is determines the depth of your faith. I need you to give this up. I ain't doing it. You might. You might. You say, that's cruel, that's mean, that's wrong. Is it? Is it? Did God give you birth? Yeah. Okay. If God gave you birth, don't you think you owe God a little bit? You got a brain that works reasonably well? You got eyes that see reasonably well? You got ears that hear reasonably well? You got a mouth that moves reasonably well. You got a job. You got a house. You got food on your table, clothes on your back, a car or two or three or four in the garage. And you got money in your... If you got anything at all, didn't God give that? Didn't God allow that? Didn't God bless you, me, us, and others with that? And so should we not be obedient and should we not give Him gifts? And should we not praise Him? What can you give Jesus? You can give Him obedience. You can give Him whatever it is that you have that He needs. But you can also give praise to y'all. And they topped the ridge. And they're only six miles away at Bethany. And they topped the ridge. And there it is. There it is, Jerusalem. Now, historians say between two or three million people show up there in Passover. One time in my life, I was really stupid. I got curious. I wonder what New Orleans is like on Mighty Drive. <laughs> now, it's been over 30 years ago, and let me tell you one thing. That memory is indelibly etched in my mind. And when I got down there, and I, I mean, I, I, was, I was hardcore. But when I got there around them fools, I said, Lord, my prayer was, Lord, if I could get my happy self out of here without getting myself killed, would you help me, please? Would you help me? You know what I'm saying? Can you imagine how it must have been to have three, two or three million people in Jerusalem cutting up and acting up? But here he comes. He got these folks behind him, and they, they several hundred brothers, and they are hooping and hollering, and I mean, having themselves a time. And as he makes that journey, down into the valley, up to Jerusalem. He passes right by Calvary. 
pretty well. Pretty well. That road led right by Calvary because the Romans were open. They wanted to make sure before you got in here, you understood there was a charm in this place. Before you walk through the front gate, you're going to find on the back doorsteps those that would dare, dare, rebel, or cause trouble in the city. Let's not, let's not forget this thing. There's some people hanging on the cross already. They hung out there all the time. They hung right by the garbage dump, and so there they are. And as Jesus walks in there, he sees the refuse, the dump, he smells the stench of it. He sees Mount Calvary. He sees the temple. He sees people in front of him. He sees people behind him. And he ain't home yet. He's making a run for it. And as he does, he starts to cry. You know, there's only three times in the scriptures that tells us that Jesus cried. Jesus, he wasn't just boo-hoo in the little old video. I mean, he's crying, no. He's crying. You know why he's crying? Because he knows that folks in there ain't going to be listening. He knows that people behind him and people in front of him and people around him, they are not listening and they don't care. They want the benefits, but they don't want, they don't want the burden. Do you hear me? They want the benefits of what God can do. They don't want the burden of having to give up to get it. And so all the, all the shouting and all the hooting and all the hollering in the world is not going to change the fact that he's fixing to suffer, bleed, and die on an old rugged cross. So as he stops and as everybody else is celebrating, he looks down and he cries and he says this. <coughs> if only you had listened, I would give you this day glory and honor and I'd give you me. But you have not and you will not so there's a day coming. There's a day coming when there will not be a stone looked upon a stone, but it's going to come tumbling down. And you're going to be scattered and decimated and destroyed because you would not accept your king. A.D. 70, Titus and his wrong leaders ascended and descended upon Jerusalem. For 143 days, they laid siege to Jerusalem. At the end of that 143 days, some 600,000 to a million people lay in the gutters of that street. Their skeletons and their dead bodies lying all through that street as testimony that God don't play around. That temple was torn, slammed down, y'all. There wasn't anything left on that temple, man. Nothing but rubble and rubbish. May I say to you, as we as we kind of wind this thing down, build your house whatever you want to. Build your house any way you choose. But may I say that Jesus is the greatest architect in eternity. And one of these days they're going to come a shake. And one of these days there's going to come a movement of God. And God's going to find out real quick and unfortunately you and I will too. What we're made of. Now if we built our house on the sand... It's going to come crumbling down. If we have built our house on the rock, on the solid rock, then it will withstand the test of whatever may come our way. Why? Because I don't have to understand a lot of things. What I need and must understand is the one thing. Jesus Christ is my Lord, my Savior, and my Master. And God knows what I don't. And God does what He chooses. And what God needs and requires out of me is my obedience and my faith. Where are you this morning on your journey with Jesus? Are you Bartimaeus sitting on the side of the road saying, I hear there's something going on and I need to know what it is so I can get some of what's passing me by? Are you Zacchaeus? I need to find out what, what, what this cat is. I need to know a little bit more about him so that I can understand what it is he has to offer. That's okay. Or are you in the crowd? Who put it hotter about what you've got but oblivious to what you don't have but what you do need? Don't ask me to repeat it. I can't. <laughs>